Hello there YouTube fam! Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whatever time of day it is where you're watching from, we wish you the very best of it. If this is your first time on the channel, a very warm welcome to you. We're so glad that you've joined us. Um, I'd love for you to be part of our YouTube family, so go ahead and hit the subscribe button. And while you're at it, why not hit the bell sign too, so you can get regular notifications every time great videos and live streams like this one are out. Well, this is episode three of Lockdown Lowdown, and I'm so delighted and honored to have as my very special guest today, CEO of UCB Radio Ireland, broadcaster, radio broadcaster at that, of over 30 years, and founder of 180 Media, a dear mentor of mine as well, Mr. Robbie Frawley. Hi, Robbie. Oh, thank you. It's great that you've joined us. So delighted that you've joined us today. <laughs> yeah, I think we're all going through that phase at the moment. Uh, it suits you well, Robbie. Excellent. So, Robbie, you're CEO of UCB Radio. You've been a broadcaster, radio broadcaster, for over 30 years. You've got lots of experience running, um, of course, a radio station, and you've managed some great artists as well. Um, but what I'd like to do, so that we can basically go ahead and paint a broader picture, um, for our viewers. I'd like to take it back to your early days so we can get, you know, just a better understanding of your background. Um, so if you'd like to talk us through where you were born, um, what it was like growing up, a bit more about your family too, that would be great. The swing in sixties. Okay, excellent. Um, Robbie, we're just having some sound issues, I'm afraid. Um, so we're just going to make sure that we have that um, all under wraps. Just trying to determine why that is. Okay. Okay. Robbie, can you say something or just double check that they can hear you now? Fish and chips, guys, working for you? Can you guys hear Robbie? Send us a comment if you can hear Robbie, okay. It is. They're a bit. Yeah, let's, let's see what we can do. I'm not too sure why they can't hear you, so I'm just going to see what we can do. Guys, how is that? Is that any better? Can you hear Robbie a little better now? Nope. <laughs> 
<laughs> we did. Don't worry, we'll, we'll get it back up. We are... When... No. Well, the stream is up, so let's see what we can do. So, uh, let's go again. Okay, so... I, I can't hear you at the moment. Ah, okay. Hmm. That is interesting. We'll go again. Let's let's get this sound audio going. Okay, Ravi. Say something. Ravi, can you hear me? No? Oh, okay. I do not know what's happening. Let's try again. Audio. No. Okay. I think it's Skype then. Let's look at our settings. Okay, Robbie, so hopefully this is working now. Hi, can you, can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Excellent. And I can hear you right. perfectly. And the screens are working, so we'll go again. <laughs> and hopefully, Technology, eh? Yeah. Technology. And hopefully it will just be smooth sailing from here. Yeah, let's see. Okay, so let's end this. Okay, and let's double check with our viewers. Okay, so we should... Okay, so I'm going to end this stream and just try again. Okay. Oh, okay, wait, we're back on. Oh, okay, good. Okay, guys, can you Hi. hear us? <laughs> Hi there, guys, can you hear us okay? Can you hear me? Yeah, now they can hear. Thanks so much, um, Sharon. We Wonderful. really appreciate that. Yay, we're back and running. Okay, guys, Yay. so quick Very prayer good. for us, and let's hope everything goes smoothly from here on. No more technical right. difficulties. So, okay. in case you missed out, Robbie was just giving us an update um, really about his life. Um, he was telling us more about his early life. He was filling us in on growing up in the swinging 60s and he was telling us more about his family and he's a middle child which explains a lot actually oh thanks very much thanks <laughs> yeah i think i think there's something yeah, there is something as a middle child that's um that's that's quite different you know you don't have the responsibility that the older child has uh, i i do think it's unfair because the older child has to take responsibility to be the one to be mature. And then the baby of the family kind of gets away with anything. Mm -hmm. But it seems, and I'm not saying this is always the truth, but it seems as you're growing up as a middle child, you're kind of left on your own. Yeah. Now, th that's a bad thing for some people. Uh, for others, they might think, yeah, yeah, I want to be anonymous. I don't want to be known by any anybody. Yeah. But for the older sibling and the younger sibling, they always look upon it as, 
he gets away with everything. You know, I'm in the middle, so no one really pays attention. But yeah, uh, we were a very close family, a very, very close family, yeah, the three of us. Uh, good, good brothers together. Excellent. Now, Robbie, yeah. um, something that's quite a sensitive subject, but you've been very kind to, to speak about it, um, and that's the fact that you, you lost your mum or she went to, to heaven uh, at, a, at a very young age for you. So you were nine but when I she was. passed away. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, she died of cancer, and um, at the time, uh, cancer in the 70s was a really, really, it wasn't rare, it was just new, and no one talked about it. Mm. No one knew how to speak about it, really. And in the days when I was growing up as a child, uh, to protect the children from the truth was seen to be the best thing. Mm. Um, uh, so for a long time, we knew mum was ill, but didn't know how ill. So we were farmed out as brothers to different relatives and different family. And uh, we lived with different members of our family for years. Um, you know, there was a time when I didn't see my two brothers for probably six, seven, maybe even eight months. Wow. Um, because, not because we didn't love each other, but because they were in different parts of the city. Um, they were cared for in different ways, just like I was. Mm -hmm. um, and then... Myself and my younger brother lived with my aunt, who was my mum's eldest sister. We lived with them for five years mm -hmm. um, uh, through the last year of mum's illness and then through our schooling years as well mm -hmm. after mum had passed away. Uh, and the most incredible thing here, uh, it, Beverly, is, is family. Mm -hmm. And um, I have said this time and time again, and I will say it to anybody without the extended family on both sides, my mum's side and my dad's side. Mm. I honestly don't know where the Frawley boys would have ended up. Mm. Uh, um, and it takes, it was sacrificial on their behalf yeah. to make sure that that we were cared for in such a way that we turned out semi-okay. Mm. And um, looking at the three of us now and where we're at and what we've done, you know, we're all parents in our own right. Um, I can say without pride in ourselves, mm. but being proud of them, yeah. they did a fantastic job, every one of them. They gave so much so that we could actually get on with some kind of normality. Yeah, that's wonderful. But, and it, it's, yeah. a, it's a real blessing because, you know, to have a family that's there to support you through, through the ups and downs, and it's not always perfect. It isn't smooth sailing no. all the time. But, no, um, not at all. It's that unity that, that kind of pulls you through the, the tough times. Yeah, it is. And, you know, it's, 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 some people have said to me, well, how did you cope with life? And mm. I, I think you just kind of get on with it. You're nine, you know. Mm. Sure, you miss your mum. And, uh, you know, it only dawns on you after a period of time that actually she's never coming back. Mm. Uh, but I, you have a choice. And the mm. choice is that you get on with life or you allow life kick you. Mm. And you allow life to defeat you uh, or you choose to embrace or take hold of or become stronger through adversity mm. so that you can actually deal with life and whatever life throws at you there on in. Yeah. Um, and I think for, for the three of us, that's how we did. That's how we dealt with it. And my dad included, but he was working shift work and you know we, we saw little of him in our formative early teenage years mm. um, not because he wasn't around but because he was working shift work yeah. but you have to embrace it you have to grab it you have to run with it and you have to understand that we we don't control the things that are dealt with us no. we control how we respond to Absolutely. what's dealt with and uh, how you deal with that is is how ultimately you will I suppose progress through life Absolutely. That's that's such a key piece of advice, Robbie. And it's so true. We we can't control, you know, the outside situation or what no. happens, but we can choose how how to respond to it. Um, and I hope guys listening in, especially with what's going on around us, and we'll come to that later, but yeah. I hope that's that's a really strong piece of encouragement there. Um, and we can choose how to react. Um, okay, great. So, Robbie, from here, what I'd like to move on to is how did you how did you come to know Jesus? Because you've dedicated your life to Him now. So, how did that yeah. happen? Uh, I, 
I I was a kind of a lost boy. I was I was fifteen or thereabouts, and uh, my older brother got involved with some prayer meetings. You know, <laughs> he got involved with this this kind of weird. Uh, uh, what what seemed to be a weird bunch of people, right. and uh, I, I I went through a phase of thinking that he would become a priest because he would leave the house with his Bible and his guitar, and you know he'd begun to sing. In my mind, as a as a kid at the time, thinking he was going to be singing Kumbaya and you know on on the street corner somewhere, <laughs> but he had found something a lot deeper than that. He had found a real relationship with Jesus, and for me. Uh, he invited me along to a prayer meeting that he held. He, he sorted it out and held it in our local community center. Mm. And I went with a next door neighbor. And these people were praying audibly. Mm. These people, some of these people were actually putting their hands up you know, in, in prayer. And I'm thinking, they're nuts. They're crazy. They're like, you know, they're bonkers. But there was something much deeper than that. Mm. And... Uh, I began to realize, even at 15, that these people had something that I didn't have. And uh, they, they had something that I was actually longing for, which was acceptance and uh, some kind of security. Now, as it turns out, most of them would tell you they weren't secure. They were just winging it. Yeah. But they were winging it with God. Yeah. And there's a real difference between winging it on your own and winging it with the creator of the universe. There's a, there's a bit of a difference here. <laughs> yeah. So I went through about six months of dipping in, dipping my toe in the world of prayer meetings and, uh, and that sort of thing. And then at the age of 15, I remember I was at a house uh, meeting on a Tuesday night. And it was at the end of the meeting. The meetings always ended with tea and coffee, as they do. Christian mm -hmm. way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And in Gene Nolan's kitchen, I gave my life to the Lord. Uh, and uh, it was 1979. Wow. I was 15. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, and I was crazy from then on in, though. It, was, yeah. it, it wasn't, you know, I didn't suddenly become, yay, look at me, I'm going to be a preacher. It really was up and down. Yeah. It really, really was. But there were good people around me to make sure that it didn't go too far down. Excellent. Speaking of good people around you, there's an interesting story of a youth group and a really cool church where Bono is worship leader. Bono from U2. Yeah, yeah. He, he, Bono and The Edge and Larry were part of the early church that I was involved with. Um, and uh, I, I actually, I, I learned how to play the drums over years. And uh, uh, the first drum kit I ever played was Larry's. Uh, right. He didn't know that until about five years ago. <laughs> I just happened to go, uh, guess what? Your, your drum kit was the very first drum kit I ever played. <laughs> Uh, we were all part of the same fellowship, was, which was Shalom, under uh, an incredible couple, Chris and Lillian Rowe. Uh, the most incredible itinerant preachers you could have come across. Just a heart for people and a heart for the gospel. And somehow they were like magnets for young people. And uh, we were part of that. We used to meet out in Temple Oak, South Dublin, out in the castle. And we were part of that meeting, part of that thriving community. And Bono was there, and so was The Edge, and so was Larry in the very early days of U2. And uh, that's that's where they were. And uh, it was just, I mean, no one looked upon Bono and Larry and The Edge as like, whoa, it's U2. They just yeah. Went, yeah, they're just who they are. And cool. um, it was, yeah, that's that's where we were part of things. And it wasn't, it, it was a group of young people. It wasn't necessarily a youth group because it, mm -hmm. it wasn't like church is today. Mm -hmm. It was just a Sunday night meeting and a midweek meeting and you all sat on the floor in a dirty great big cold room with some carpets on the ground and whoever could play a few chords grabbed the guitar and away you went. And sometimes Bonner did that. Sometimes my older brother did that. Yeah. Sometimes other people did it. It was just good, honest fellowship. It was just no strings attached. There was no hang-ups. There was no professionalism. It was... We'll sing it if we know the words. That's it was brilliant. Great. Sounds like a great group to be a part of. Yeah, but again, they, they, those kind of people and those kind of relationships form your relationships and your your life for years to come. Yeah. Absolutely. They give you a bedrock of what you're going to do and, and uh, what is, it, it becomes your plumb line as to what's real and what isn't. Mm. And, and for me, I really enjoyed it. It was great. Yeah. Well, for your sake and mine, Robbie, I'm very glad that you had a, uh, those experiences and that helped form from form your relationships and give you a backdrop really to base them on. Yeah, there's always 
here's the thing. There's, there's always people who are willing to invest their life in you. Mm. You have to be willing to allow them. And sometimes that's easy to say and more difficult to actually deliver. But if we do, uh, then more learned men and women than you and I mm. are going to invest in you and I mm. so that we can one day invest in other people with the kingdom. And we can pass on some of the gems that they have, have given to us. We can pass that on. But we have to be willing to to learn from them. We have to be willing to realize that we don't know it all. As a matter of fact, half the time we know nothing. Yeah. we just got to trust these people and uh, learn, trust the word of God, trust the will of God for your life, and, and move with that. And see what happens, see where it takes you. Absolutely. Now, um, speaking of where things take you, tell us a bit more about how did you how did you fall into radio? Uh, radio, uh, I was at a prayer meeting and somebody came to the prayer meeting to speak about radio and said, you know, we're setting up this radio station. It was in Dublin mm. and uh, we want some presenters. And I'd always... I'd always mucked about with music, mixing it and that sort of thing. And mm-hmm. I'm so I'm a musician and music is in my blood. And my uh, girlfriend at the time said to me, you're going to be great at that. I went, no, not a chance. I'm not doing that. And I went off to grab a cup of coffee or something after the meeting. And next minute I had a tap on the shoulder from the guy who was talking about radio saying, she said that you want to get involved. And mm-hmm. uh, I kind of looked, I went, uh, he said, come and talk to us. And, Pretty much that's how it started. I was 18 years of age. Uh, that's how it started. And my first radio show was with the Irish Christian Broadcasting Service. And I used to uh, go to a convent out in Glasnevin in North Dublin every Monday night. And uh, that's where I would do my first ever radio show. And it was on an AM transmission across Dublin. If the static was too much, you couldn't hear it. If the static was all right, well, it carried all the way down maybe to Wicklow somewhere. It was just fun times. It was... It was pioneering stuff uh, that's how I started it was somebody else who saw something in me that went you'd be good at that and that's yeah. how I started wow fantastic. and uh, I've loved it I've loved every minute of it yeah well you're you're great at what you do I can um I can stand uh as t- <laughs> <laughs> to that um, you're too kind and you know it makes sense now 18 I didn't realize you were that young when you started so I was I was 18 years of age when I started um mm-hmm. So we're, we're getting up for nearly 40 years in broadcasting now. Um, and, you know, I went through a phase trying to make it work, trying to force it to work. When I moved to the UK, I really tried to force it to work. Mm. I worked for uh, national AM stations that were rock and roll stations. I worked for uh, local FM stations. But my real desire was to be in Christian radio. And there was no window for that. There was no opportunity for it. And sometimes you just got to let that go. Mm. And, and see what will happen. And I remember we were moving house and I was packing stuff away and I found a lot of interviews that I'd done with people like BB and CC Winans from uh, the 80s and Kim Hale and uh, Russ Taff, all these people from the 80s. And I said to my wife, I said, was all that done in vain? Mm. And she went, nothing was ever wasted in God's economy. And it was in months, so I can't remember exactly how many months, but it wasn't many, that UCB called me. And they said, we need an Irish voice. We hear that you're in radio. Will you come and do some volunteering for us? And that was 21 years ago. That's fantastic. And that's how it all began again. And uh, I think sometimes you have to lay, you have to lay it down sometimes. Yeah. Because when you lay it down, then you realize that it really isn't yours anyway. And if you lay it down and it's supposed to be yours, God will give it back to you. Mm -hmm. And he'll give it back to you the way you're supposed to have it. And for me, I ended up being the breakfast jock uh, on UCB, what was Europe, which became UCB UK, which is now UCB One for those people who know it in the UK. And I did that show for 12 years. And I loved every, every, every minute of it. There wasn't a moment in that radio show that I didn't really, it was, it was probably one of the greatest privileges of my life Mm -hmm. to be able to sit in that chair every day and just have fun. And just tell people that Jesus loved them. It was Monday, I know, but Jesus loves you. And you know what? It's going to be all right. It's going to, and, and we'd have a laugh doing it as well. Because we're supposed to laugh. We're supposed to live life to the full. Jesus said that. Yeah. And I loved it. And again, when we lay it down, Beverly, when we give it back to God, mm-hmm. if it's supposed to be, he will give it back to us. Mm-hmm. If not, you were never supposed to have it anyway. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's the way we've done it. 
and it's so true um i've of course i've met lynn and you know she's a wonderful yeah. lady and you could really see her passion for, for the lord and speaking of laying it down you guys have have done that in in so many different ways um i'd like to talk about rachel and matthew um sure yeah your your two children they had very short lives here on earth um they're they're with the lord now and mm. we'll see them one day um but what's amazing to me is it kind of the way that you what you said about laying it down and god is so amazing because you know he gave you he gave you sam and emma um a yeah. boy and a girl again yeah. Um, yeah. And it's amazing to see your faithfulness and his faithfulness. So can you tell us a little bit about um, Rachel and, and Matthew? Sure, yeah. I think with every couple, when they get married, they, they have these dreams about what it's going to be like. Mm -hmm. you know, and they have these, these ideas of what family life will be like. And uh, that's a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. That's a great thing to, to do, to have focus and to have dreams about what you want. Uh, for us, our firstborn... Uh, we were, I was living in the UK um, and I had been there since 1985. It was now 1990 and uh, we'd been married a couple of years and our firstborn was born actually in Dublin. We were on holiday. We were here for a celebration and uh, Rachel was born in the Coombe uh, in South Dublin and uh, she was born prematurely. She was born at 25 weeks and uh, she was very ill. Um, all the doctors would say to us is we're trying, but you know she was very ill, and uh, I I remember the twenty four hours, forty eight hours, whatever it was, in terms of my numbness. I remember it all very clearly, and in the moment, thinking my world has shattered, it's gone, because you don't know whether to celebrate because you've had a baby, you don't know whether to grieve because you don't know whether that baby's going to survive uh, so you just kind of stay in limbo you just stay in the middle of it all and you try and balance the whole thing uh, Lynn was in hospital had never been in hospital in her life she was in hospital in a foreign land her mum and dad were flying in I was trying to be the, the the kind of business and organize everything and in the middle of all this nagging was well, she's my little girl she's my little girl and I'm dad and I can't do anything for her there's nothing I can do. We weren't even allowed to hold her. Um, and the reality is that the doctor came to us and said, she's too ill. There's nothing we can do. And I've never seen a doctor cry before at that stage. And I saw this man genuinely cry before, saying, I can't do any more for her. If I do, I'll kill her. Um, and there comes a point when when you realize that you've passed that place where you, you have to take a step and say, okay, God, she's yours. And Rachel has always been uh, our firstborn. Mm -hmm. She's always been my, my firstborn was born in Ireland. Yeah. And that just blows me away. And together they allowed us, when we'd made a decision that we weren't going to go any further uh, with treatment and Rachel was going to die, uh, they allowed us hold her. Um, and she was so light there was there was I mean the blankets almost weighed more than she did uh, and they waited for us to give them permission to switch the machine off um, and when we did and all the machines went silent it was just the three of us and in the middle of all that we lived the verse that says he gives you peace that passes all understanding you see, people say, how can you say that of God? And I say, well, you know what? Maybe me and God will have a conversation about it one day. But for now, all I've got is what he gave me at the time. Mm. And we tangibly could feel the peace of God. Does it make it any easier? No. Does it help you to walk through it? Yeah, it does. And uh, so we, we buried Rachel in, in Milton Keynes. We had a service here in, in Ireland and family and friends arrived from all over the world. Uh, quite incredible. And then we, we buried her in Milton Keynes. And a year, a year later, we had a son, Matthew, and he was younger again. He was only 21 weeks. 
And uh, the hospital was a very different experience. And the hospital were doing nothing and would do nothing. Mm -hmm. And I remember holding him in the room uh, where he had been delivered and just collapsing in a corner, just sobbing over my son. And again, I'm not trying to say anything or put myself in an elevated position at all. But I just felt God say to me, give him back to me. Now you know what I went through when I gave Jesus on the cross. Just hand him over. Because I knew when I handed him over, he was going to die. There was nothing that would be done. And I'm not saying my son and Jesus are equivalent. I'm not saying that at all. But there is something in everything that you've got to grasp hold of. No matter what you go through, if you don't grasp hold of something to carry you through it, you'll stay in that moment. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. I, I had the moment there and then to go, okay, I, I can't do any more than this. I handed him over. It was my father-in-law actually took him from me, and I was brokenhearted. And I thought, God, if not, now what? He said, well, you just got to trust me. I think I've been here already. You know, here we go. But you do. And I, I dug deep, and as a couple, we dug deep, and we waited and waited and waited to see what God would do. Um, it is it's a step of faith all the time. People say, how can God do that to you? I don't know. And I will ask him the question. But there is also a verse that says, consider my servant Job. Mm -hmm. Okay. When bad things come against us, we can either anger at God or we can grab hold of him and say, now pull me out of it. Yeah. What are you going to do? And there is a point when God says to, when God says to the devil, consider my servant Job. In other words, have a pop at him and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Have a go with him. See what happens here. And, of course, Satan's all like, yeah, well, he's going to curse you. And that. No, he isn't. No, he isn't. Because he holds on to the shirt tails of God in order to survive. And sometimes that's what we have to do in the pain and the suffering and the loss of a loved one. Right now, COVID-19, so many people with a loss of loved ones. Somewhere in the middle of it all, if all I could say, even by your fingernails, if you can grab hold of the shirt tails of God just to drag you through where you are. There will come a point when you're able to stand on your own two feet and go, thank you. Now, now, I'm, now I'm ready to move on. Now I'm ready to go further. So, it, yeah, it was a tough time. But if we live in that moment of 1990 and 1991, we'll have missed the last 25 years mm -hmm. and, and what's possible there. Now, you were speaking of Job, Robbie, and of course we know that God gave him back um, what, what he'd lost and in, yeah. a, in a wonderful way. And it's amazing because, um, you know, you've got Sam now and, and yeah. you've got Emma um, and they're yeah. both in their 20s and they're wonderful. Yeah. Sam is a very talented musician um, and Emma's yeah. just, she's wonderful. Um, so that that's really amazing. And I'm so proud of the way that you and Lynn, through the ups and downs, have have been sure to, to be faithful and to keep trusting. Um, and it's not easy, but it's no. what, what you've done, in, you know, in spite of it not being easy, being very yeah, difficult think, at times. I think you have to. I, I think you have to. I mean, when Sam was born, uh, he again was born very prematurely. He was uh, a 26 week or 26 and three days, I think he was. Mm -hmm. And days matter at that age and that gestation of pregnancy. They really matter. Uh, and he was two pound four or something when he was born or two pound. I can't remember. He's, he's 27 now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and But again, we called him Samuel because he's gift of God. Mm -hmm. That's why we called him Samuel. And uh, again, you know, we, there was prayer over him, and I've never seen a church and a world come, our, our world of our friends, come together like they did for his life. Mm -hmm. And there was prayer, and there was prayer daily for him, every day. I would go into the, uh, to the hospital, and I would pray over him every day, and I would read the Psalms over him every day. And so much so that we got to a stage where the nurses would stop, and they'd listen to the Word of God as I read over him in his incubator. And then other family members would say, can you pray over our child? Can you read over our child? And the power is in the word of God. The power isn't in Robbie Frawley. The power is in the word of God. And it, I used to pray over him that the word of God would be a lamp to his feet and a light to his path, life to his body and health to his bones. That was how I finished my prayer every day. Mm -hmm. 
uh, for all of his life, pretty much, until he was a teenager. Um, and then I still pray for that, that, that secretly for him. But he went through it all. He, he was in hospital for about three months. And uh, and then, you know, God says, you're not done yet. There's another addition to the family. And I'm going, oh, yeah, we're done. And he said, oh, you're not. And Emma was born. And uh, Emma was born really young. She was born at 23 weeks. She weighed one pound wow. when she was born. And uh, I remember having an argument with God the night she was born because God had promised she was a child of promise and Emma means fighter. I didn't realize that when we named her, but that's wow. what it means. And, and, uh, I did this deal with God. I said to God, look, here's the deal. If I sleep tonight and the hospital don't wake me, I'm going to trust you because if the hospital don't wake me, it means that Emma's survived the night. Mm -hmm. That's all I've got. Take it or leave it. Because I was really, really, desperate i was at that point of thinking why again and i i woke myself in the morning uh, the hospital didn't wake me and i woke myself and uh, i went to go and uh, see emma and god said to me read genesis 22 and i said no 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 i've got to go and see emma first no read genesis 22 so i had this argument with god while lynn was asleep in the bed and i'm uh, i'd stepped on the floor in this hospital room and I had this argument with God, and eventually I got my Bible out, and I flicked through Genesis 22, and it's the story of Abraham and Isaac. It's the story of the chapter where Abraham is asked by God to sacrifice Isaac. And everything within me went, what are you doing? He said, read it. I read it five times before the penny dropped. Mm -hmm. You see, Isaac was a child of promise. He was God's promise. But Abraham was asked to lay him on the altar. Abraham's response was very simply this. When they, when they saw the mountain and they had the, uh, the servants with them, he said, you stay here while I and the boy go and worship and we will return to you. Sometimes people miss that verse. It's the most important verse in it because even in his heart of his turmoil, even in his craziness, Abraham didn't lose sight of the promise that God had given him. We will return. And when they get there, Isaac kind of cottons on to this. He goes, Dad, we've got the fire, we've got the wood, but we've got no sacrifice. What's going on? And Abraham again says, the Lord himself will provide the ram. And in our moment of anguish, in our moment of pain and hurt, we need to be listening for the still, small voice of God, not the glaring shout. Mm. Because when Abraham tied Isaac up, put him on the altar and went to slay him, he heard, Abraham, Abraham, don't harm him. He heard even in the moment, and I knew that I had to give her, give her back to God and say, well, she's yours. She's on the altar. Now it's up to you. And she's a miracle upon miracle upon miracle. And uh, a, a, an incredibly clever girl. And uh, hopefully we're going to get her married someday soon because of COVID-19, she was supposed to get married in April, but uh, we can't do that right now. So uh, she's uh, engaged to be married and hopefully we're going to get her married towards the end of this year. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 God willing. Um, so Robbie, speaking of this still small voice of God, and it's amazing mm. the different ways he presents that still sm small voice to us, even through radio too, um, amazing stories that really stick out to me with your career is um, that one time where you had to talk down somebody who was trying to commit suicide and they were serious because some people just thought oh, to do that. Um, can yeah, we talk about that quickly and then the other incident with the lady who had said goodbye to her family? Sure, no, no problem. The first one happened when I was on a rock and roll station. You see, you don't have to be in Christian circles mm. to be a Christian and to be used by God. Mm -hmm. I was playing Elvis Presley and everything rock and roll because I was working for a, ch a commercial radio station. Mm -hmm. And at four o'clock in the morning, I'll never forget it, I had a phone call from a lady to say, I have uh, the kitchen knife at my throat and I'm going to take my life. What are you going to do about it? And uh, you immediately think, is this a hoax or is it for real? I chose it to be a real situation. And actually, for the next hour or thereabouts, we talked, I would say, the odd thing on radio, but I kept her on the phone. Mm -hmm. I was able to somehow talk her down from that. And over the next week, she would phone me every day. 
And finally, on day five, uh, I was able to lead her to Jesus over the phone. And this is a rock and roll station. It's like, okay. <laughs> like, some of the tracks we were playing, I'm thinking, I don't care where you are. When we're in the middle of it, God shines through. And for that lady, uh, we put her in a church. She, she was local to her. Uh, there was a church local to her. We knew the pastor there. We got her in there. And uh, it was around about the time Matthew was born. And I was off air for about six weeks. And when I came back, the first phone call I got was from this lady. And she picked up the phone. and dialed me. It was about 1 o'clock in the morning and 12 o'clock in the morning, whatever it was. She said, I'm here. I'm still alive. And I still love Jesus. That's wonderful. Gosh. You don't have to be in a church, a pastor. No. You don't have to be on Christian radio to make a difference in somebody's life. You just have to listen and respond to what God asks you to do. And the second one was a real surprise to me, really. It was while I was uh, doing the breakfast show for UCB in the UK. I got a phone call from a lady who said, I want to say thank you. And in that, uh, she said, I'll tell you why I'm saying thank you. Four years previously, it had taken her four years to build up the courage to call me. Four years previously, she had kissed her family goodbye, sent the kids off to school, sent her husband out. She wrote a, a letter to her family, mm -hmm. and she went into the garage and, and put a hose pipe in the car and started the engine. She was going to take her life. And she forgot that UCB was on on the radio. So it came on the minute the car was switched on. And I said these words, according to her, I said these words, whatever you're about to do, stop. It's not that bad. Jesus loves you. Mm. And I played the next song. Mm. And I knew nothing of that moment in her life until four years later. She switched the engine off. She got down on her knees. She gave her life back to the Lord. And this is all her story, not mine. And uh, she got her family right and she got her life right, uh, which was fantastic. And it was a massive encouragement to me to know that it doesn't matter what you say when you say it. When the Spirit of God is involved, he will take everything that you say and do and use and use it for somebody's good somewhere. And it's a privilege to be part of that and a privilege to be used by God in those circumstances. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, these are just a few of some of the amazing stories of your life, Robbie. I wish we had, you know, more time to talk about them. But guys, fortunately for you, Robbie's written a book. There we go. There um, it is. This is my. This is all me, by the way. He didn't ask me to do this or anything like that, because um, he's no. far too humble to do that. But I read this, and it's wonderful. And you can get it on Amazon, so I highly recommend it. It's called Air Waves and Ocean Waves: A Story of Trust in Times of Change, and it's all about Robbie's life. Um, those fantastic stories of him growing up, and uh, these two stories that we spoke about now. Um, of course, you know, more to come as well. And um, his experiences, of course, um, and Lynn's with, with Rachel um, and Matthew. And speaking of which, that's life. Like there's some stories in this book that you're just laughing. You're, you're reading them and you're laughing. And then there's other stories where they are really sad. In fact, when mum got to that part in the book, she had to take a break for a few days, but that's life. <laughs> You know, and it's like yeah. that. There, there's ups and there's downs. So, guys, check it out on Amazon. I will leave a link in the description when this stream becomes a video as well. Couldn't recommend it highly enough. It's a fantastic Thank read. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. And just lastly, Robbie, so last Tuesday, the great Christian um, apologist and um, speaker, preacher, um, yeah. theologian, uh, Ravi Zacharias, went to be with the Lord. Um, and we've yeah. spoken about life. It's, it's very brief whether you go to be with Jesus young or whether, you know, you've lived in an old and full life. Um, yeah. But it, it could be at any time. And instead of thinking of death as something depressing and something to fear, um, we should really be thinking about our legacy, right? And what kind of legacy we want to leave. So, yeah, we should. Yeah. Can you can you talk us through that a little bit more and give us some advice? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I, I was really impacted. I, 
I don't normally talk about my posts on Facebook mm -hmm. publicly, but I put something up there last night and I spoke about Ravi uh, and David Pawson is another man I've known quite well and he just passed away as well, an incredible Bible teacher. Uh, he was 90, 91. Um, and in the last few years, Beverly, we've lost, uh, only in the last couple of weeks, Ravi and David Pawson earlier this year, Reinhard Bonnke, Lois Evans last year, Tony Evans' wife, an incredible woman of God, Bob Gass last year, writer of and author of Word for Today. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of years before that, Billy Graham. Yeah. Uh, so many generals have gone to be with the Lord. And it got me thinking, there used to be a time when I was growing up, I would look up to the generals and go, one day I, would be, I want to be like that. Mm -hmm. not, in, not in kind of putting them on a pedestal, but learning from them and one day wanted to be like that. Yeah. So here's the thing. The one day is today. Mm -hmm. As these guys are going home to be with the Lord, where are the next generals? Mm. Well, actually, it's us. Mm. And I'm not saying, look at me, I'm a general. I'm saying we have to stand up. Mm. We have to stand up and be counted. We have to put a hand up and say, here I am, Lord, send me. What have you called me to do? I love what I do for a living. I don't do it for a living, but I get paid to do it. It's amazing. Mm. I love what we're trying to do at UCB Ireland. I love investing in people's lives like yourself and like Vincent and like Pauline and like Anne and others, Jackie and people who are working with us to raise. I love that because we get to invest in people's lives for the future of your life and the lives of people who listen to you, mm. but also the future for someone else to come along and take hold of a ministry when it's our turn to pass it on. Our legacy needs to be that we grab hold of what they did, mm. run with it, and pass it on to you. Yeah. That's our legacy. That's my legacy. I've got nothing. I'm only the middle. Okay. There's nothing of me. Only the middle. If I can grab what David Pawson and Ravi did. And Bob Gass. And hold that baton while I run hard. Knowing that I can encourage you to run behind me. Mm -hmm. And pass it to you. Then that's my job done. That's what I'm called to do. And that's my job done. Mm -hmm. We need to find where our next uh, band of generals are. The 50-somethings who will stand for the kingdom. The 50-somethings who will impact the world for the gospel. And the 50-somethings who will change one life mm -hmm. with a message of hope. That's what being a general is all about. Not sitting in a chair and going, look at me. It's standing at the front line and saying, let's go. We're charging. And I want to charge. Um, and, I, and I hope, I hope. I hope your involvement with UCB Ireland will want you to charge more. Oh, absolutely. I'm coming Wherever right behind you, here. don't you worry. <laughs> Wherever else you go from here, let it not be that UCB Ireland is the place where you finish. Let it mm -hmm. be the place where you start. Absolutely. Uh, and I don't know whether that answers your question or not, Beverly, but right now I think we have, we have something to, to say as this current band of generals are being taken home. It's now to stand. It's now time for us to stand up. Absolutely. And who's next? I loved what you said about it's not sitting in a chair and being like, "Ah, oh, look at me," but rather if we can just point others to Jesus. You you spoke about yep. the late great Billy Graham. You know how much mm. I love him. Um, yeah. And a interview that I've watched of his wife Ruth. Um, somebody mm -hmm. asked her this like a similar question about having a legacy and she said i don't in her lovely southern accent i don't care if they remember me if they can just remember jesus and i was like yeah. that's so beautiful yeah. and well, what like, better legacy do you yeah. have what better legacy do you have yeah At the end of the day i've watched my two kids grow up and run with god mm. as a parent that's the best legacy i can see that's the best legacy i can have as a parent watching my kids run with the lord yeah. forging their own life and then being in a position enough for Lynn and myself to be working together, forging something together as husband and wife mm. here for such a time as this. Mm. And I've never tried to build a career for myself. Mm -hmm. I've never wanted a career. Mm -hmm. That's just not what I do. Mm. And I'm not trying to be all holy and look at me super spiritual because I'm just a normal bot. Mm. The end of the day, if I can do what I'm called to do, and do it to the best of my ability because that's what God's asked me to do, then my legacy will be somewhere along the line I've impacted somebody's life because God has allowed me to be used by him. And that's a blessing for me and hopefully a blessing for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And 
lives get changed and destinies get changed and futures get changed. Absolutely. Excellent. Um, Robbie, lastly, what can we do to support you at UCB? Tell us more about UCB Ireland and the great work it's doing. Well, UCB Ireland is still on this massive journey. We are serving the church, reaching the nation. That is our six word statement. That's what we do. We are here for the Church of Ireland and beyond. Uh, we've got radio. We've got the word for today, daily devotional, two radio stations, UCB Ireland and UCB I Worship. We will have more by the end of the year. Uh, we are building our digital platform. We are looking for more ways to get out there and spread the message of the gospel. Now, there are many ways that people can can, can support us. Um, for example, the first way is, and everybody's going to go, oh, here we go, asking for money. No, the first way is pray. That's the first thing you can do for us. Pray that God will open the doors for us, for DAB and DAB+, Plus, for Serve You Across Ireland, for the best digital platforms we can get. So please pray that God will open those doors. We have them on our table. We're waiting for the authorities to say yes. The second way is pray for more godly men and women to come and join the team. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Pray for us as a team because actually we're all separate right now. We're working from home. <laughs> Beverly does her show from home. I do my breakfast show every morning from this room I'm sitting in right now. And yes, there is always a financial uh, uh, need at any ministry but right now here's here's something that's really exciting tomorrow uh, I don't know when you, this is going out we're live right now yes of course mm -hmm. we are so Tuesday and Wednesday are our annual gift days and we normally have kind of a share-a-thon kind of give us money and but we're not kind of doing it that way this time but there is an opportunity if you've never given to UCB in Ireland this is an opportunity for somebody to be able to give on a one-off gift or a monthly gift and have your gift impacted by a further 50%. So if you gave 10 euro, 20 euro a month, say, that becomes 30 euro a month because we've partnered with somebody who, who loves the ministry of UCB Ireland. So if you've never done that and you think, well, maybe I can give something, if you contact info at ucbireland.ie, it's a very simple email address, info at ucbireland.ie, we'll talk you through the process. But imagine that your giving gets impacted by a further 50%. So yes, there is money involved, but more than anything, it's prayer. Please pray for us. Absolutely. Um, guys, what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave a link to, um, of course, the UCB Island to the website where you can live stream and, and have a listen in. Also, all of our social media platforms as well, follow us. Um, you know, that will be a great support. And as Robbie said, pray. And, you know, if, if you feel led, have a, have a pray about it. And if you feel led to give, um, then, of course, you know, you're very welcome to. Um, yes. Excellent. So last week, Robbie, I always like to ask my guests this about life and lockdown. You touched about Emma briefly there. Um, yeah. And, you know, one of our close family friends um, just over the weekend, she was scheduled to have had her wedding day. Um, and right. it, yeah, and it's amazing to see so many people in this time having having their weddings you know postponed but apart from that there are also many different challenges you know job loss all yeah. of that um yeah. what's what's your advice to us uh, do you know what i i think the advice here in ireland is to to actually adhere to what we're being asked to do mm -hmm. Okay. Some people are already getting a bit kind of itchy feet and going, the government can't tell me what to do. Well, actually, they're not telling you what to do. They're suggesting mm. for our own good and our own benefit. We are seeing numbers come down. Praise God we're seeing those numbers come down now. Mm. But if we rush headlong into something and, you know, congregational meeting again and so forth, the numbers could well, I'm not a scientist or a doctor, mm -hmm. but they could well go back up again. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? Stay connected. Can you imagine, Beverly, if we were in this lockdown 30 years ago? Oh, gosh. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right. So stay connected. WhatsApp, mobile phones, text, call somebody. No one's using landlines anymore. Get in touch with people. Stay connected with your friends. Get out and get some fresh air as long as it's safe to do so and it's within your, 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 uh, your travel requirements, your travel limits. Don't, if you're working from home, don't work every hour that God gives you. 
get some time where you go, I'm done, walk away from it. We actually do go to work, Lynn and myself. Mm -hmm. She works in one end of the house, I work in the other end of the house. And we meet in the middle for normal life. Mm -hmm. Try and have some kind of normality. But in the middle of all this, remember this. Nothing surprises God. There is nothing we're going through that is a surprise to him. So we need to put our faith and our trust in the Lord and hold on to his shirt tails, as we said earlier on, and, and be sensible. That's that, I don't have any major advice. Just please be sensible for your sake and the sake of those around you. Be sensible. Absolutely. Well, we heard it here, guys, and we can do that. Just to, just thinking twice, really, before we take that action and and kind of just being disciplined as well, even with our work ethic, it's important to stretch out and to have that healthy balance between rest and work. So thanks so much, yep. Robbie. Robbie, it's been such a joy. Thank you so much for everything that you've shared. It's some very it's really difficult things to talk about. And I really appreciate your openness and your kindness. And I've been so blessed by just hearing you speak and um, hearing more about your life. So thank you so much. I'm, I'm sure our viewers have. I've seen the comments streaming through and folks talking about, you know, how, how encouraging it's been. So thank you so much for your time. Um, it's been a I, pleasure. And um, yeah, as I said, support UCB Ireland and the great work they're doing. I'll leave all the uh, social media platform links in the description of this video. Thanks so much, Robbie. Thanks so much, guys. And see you next time on Lockdown Lowdown. Great, so that's done, Robbie. We're off the air now.